I'm Professor Paul Bingham, and this is Biochemistry One. The title of today's segment is Regulation of Carbohydrate Metabolism. Let me remind you of where we've come to over the last several segments. Throughout the entire course, we've been zeroing in uh, on individual biochemical processes, molecules, and events. Uh, and let me use an analogy. Almost all of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Google Earth and Google Maps. We've been operating at street level throughout the course uh, up until the last segment. What we're doing now, we began just at the end of the last segment, and we're going to continue over the next couple of segments, is now to zoom back and look at how these individual processes at street level organize themselves into communities and nation states uh, to push the metaphor all the way to the end. Uh, <clears throat> in other words, we're going to be looking at how all these biochemical events are orchestrated to allow the flow of energy and carbon and nitrogen to some degree through biological systems, allowing them to both power their uh, movements and thought processes, but also build and repair their tissues. So we've again, we've been looking at individual events and processes. What we now want to do is, is begin to look at the entire big picture. So let's look at the energetics of glycolytic reactions and their implications for regulation. We've touched on this earlier, but I want to come back and really focus your attention on it so that you can understand regulation of this major uh, street, so to speak. That is a whole segment of metabolic steps. So this again is the detailed picture of glycolysis that we've looked at uh, before, one of them. And shown in this table are the energetics, the free energy changes associated with each of those reactions. And let me note, let me call your attention to the fact that there are in fact two columns. One is the the so-called standard free energy, the delta G0, that's the uh, uh, sort of central column in the table. And then there's just delta G. And delta G takes into account not only the standard free energy change of the reaction, but the effects of mass action uh, uh, resulting from very different um, product and, and uh, substrate levels. So you'll notice, for example, uh, notice here delta G zero in the middle column, and then delta G to the right, with delta G being really the way things are in, in vivo, where we're, we're taking into account the concentrations of substrate for these reactions. So you'll notice that there are three reactions, which uh, boxed in red, which in vivo have very large delta Gs. Um, and we're going to focus on each of those over the next few minutes. Uh, but let me call your attention to the fact that there is another reaction here, the aldolase reaction, line 4, which has a moderately large negative delta G, minus 5.9. But no, look at its delta G0. It's plus 22.8. You may recall we talked about this briefly when we were looking at glycolysis, that this is actually an energetically very unfavorable reaction, but its products are immediately pulled away and run through the rest of glycolysis so that the um, mass action effect gives you a actually operational free energy that's negative. But notice that the, four, the three reactions that are boxed, however, not only is the delta G in vivo strongly negative, but the delta G zero is strongly negative. So these are reactions that are inherently exor exergonic. That is, they're inherently driven f in the forward direction. And these are the kinds of steps that operate and can operate in vivo far from equilibrium, and they are the steps that uh, tend to be the targets of regulation, and that's certainly true in glycolysis. There are three major points at which glycolysis is regulated for the reasons that we'll review over the next few minutes, and every one of those three points has both a large in vivo operational delta G, even when mass action effects are taken into account, but in addition has an intrinsic negative delta G, that's delta G zero. It's, 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 uh, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, ideal the delta G, if you will, okay, delta G under standard conditions. So here is another di way of saying that same thing. Here are each of the steps starting from at glucose and ending at pyruvate, and their rough free energy change, their rough energy, so that the change is uh, uh, represented by vertical movement, is indicated. So notice that the first and third reactions that we um, <coughs> uh, boxed in the uh, table a moment ago, and then the final reaction, the, the conversion of 5-phosphalenopyruvate to pyruvate, are um, large. The, m the other uh, reaction four is that aldolase reaction, which has a moderate no negative delta G as a result of mass action effects, but is in fact inherently an energetically unfavorable reaction. It is these three big changes, one, three, and ten, that are the targets of regulation, each of these three.
Each is regulated in a different way. Each fits into the larger context that we'll gradually work our way toward over the next several segments differently. That is, they're regulated, but each of them is regulated for a somewhat different purpose. Okay? All right. So, uh, first, let's, let's take just a first look at uh, a couple of these uh, uh, processes, and then we'll come back in more detail in a moment. So, uh, elevated uh, levels drive um, G6P into glycogenesis. That is, if you have elevated levels of the product of this first enzyme, that is G6P, it tends to drive glycogenesis. Much more about that later. That turns out to be a relatively secondary process, uh, uh, as we'll see in a moment. Important, but secondary. And then uh, um, the final step, so that's the, that would be step 10 in the table that we're looking at a moment ago, the conversion of phosphoenolpyruvate to ATP and pyruvate. Uh, this reaction is also regulated um, by um, uh, in ways that we'll come to in a few moments. But each of these processes, the first and tenth, are um, uh, regulated for uh, more contextual purposes. They're not the thing that's controlling flux through the glycolytic pathway itself. It's these two that are x here are manipulating uh, a flow around the glycolytic pathway for reasons that we're going to come to as we start putting glycolysis into context. The real control of the flow through glycolysis itself is this third box that's not X'd. Let's look at that. This is the primary control point for the flux through glycolysis in most tissues, including muscle. Okay, so there's its reaction blown up. It is the phosphofructokinase reaction in which fructose 6 phosphate is phosphorylated with the expenditure of 1 ATP. Remember, this is one of the two, two investment steps in glycolysis, uh, creating bis 1 6, I'm sorry, fructose 1 6 bis phosphate, or F16 P, as it's sometimes abbreviated. It is this step, the phosphofructokinase step, that is regulated. We're going to look at this actually in several ways, both today and then we'll even return to it indirectly in subsequent lectures because it is such a pivotal control point. Stop and think for a moment. Uh, uh, almost all the glycolytic, uh, the carbohydrate carbon, and that would include amino acids that have been converted to glucose by gluconeogenesis, for example. All of that carbon is going to flow through glycolysis, and this is the point at which all of that carbon is controlled. And as we've alluded to, and again we'll see repeatedly over the next uh, several segments, uh, glucose levels in the blood are a primary source of energy for almost every tissue in the body. So we're looking at the regulation of the one of the primary metabolic fluxes. So this is a really, really important regulatory event. Okay. All right, here it is, phosphofructokinase. So let's look at its control here, and then, as I said, we'll call it back over the next several segments and peel more layers off the, the sophisticated control of this molecule. It's really important. Okay. So here is the uh, reaction that it catalyzes. And let me just call your attention to the fact that ATP is one of the pre is the precursor, right? It's the, it's the high energy phosphate donor to create, to add the phosphate uh, ester to fructose 6-phosphate to make 1,6. And ADP is one of the products of the hydrolysis of ATP, the transfer of that phosphate to, uh, one six, to, to 6 to make 1,6 fructose. But I'm also calling your attention to the fact that magnesium ions are present here. It turns out that both ATP and ADP having these big phosphate, these phosphate clusters, uh, a lot of negative charge, actually uh, coordinate with or chelate, as it's called, a magnesium ion. So later when we talk about uh, ATP and ADP as allosteric regulators, just be conscious of the fact that we're actually talking about the ATP magnesium complex and the A ADP magnesium complex. We'll just, sim for simplicity, omit a magnesium in, our, in the images, but it's always there. Okay, so let's look at the allosteric uh, regulators here. So the, the, they, the, the first set that we're looking at makes just beautiful sense. So in fact, if you are short of ATP, if you're deprived of energy, what do you want to do? Well, one of the things you're going to want to do is run glycolysis faster. And that is in fact exactly what you see. You see both AMP and ADP, the hydrolysis products of ATP, are allosteric activators of uh, 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 fructose uh, uh, phosphofructokinase or PFK, as it's sometimes called, abbreviated. And likewise, if you've turned all of your ATP and ADP into ATP, you're replete with energy. You don't need any more at the moment. Mm -hmm.